Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, executive producer and host of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. My guests today are Alexandra Minnestern and Howard Markell, authors of Formative Years Children's Health in the United States, 1880 to 2000. Welcome to Rip Rap, Alexandra and Howard. In today's society, we're so used to the existence of pediatrics, the medical expe uh, specialty explored in your book, formative years that we often forget that it had its origin relatively recently, especially as a formal part of an academic medical school. Could you share with us the origins of the medical specialty of some 50,000 American physicians and the role of specific people like Dr. Abraham Jacoby at the New York Medical College? Well, to start, I mean, one of the things that's fascinating about looking at the history of pediatrics is that you have to look at the history of a variety of different social domains. So on the one hand you have to understand the kinds of changes that were going on in the late 19th century with the emergence of a new type of family with the transition from rural to more rural to urban society, the types of things that were happening in scientific theories writ large with ideas from Darwinism and evolution which enabled in so, to some extent physicians to think about um, you know childhood itself as a distinct phase in the life cycle and then things connected to that which would be um, the rise of um, certain types of, of both academic institutions and institutions serving children primarily in cities and those were institutions that eventually became dispensaries and um, more modern types of orphanages so it's very important to understand the context and that's one of the things that we wanted to do in this book was really to provide a context for understanding how was it that a specialty devoted specifically to children, you know, and to people at a certain phase in the life cycle emerged alongside specialties that were um, usually about uh, focused on specific organs, the heart or um, the kidneys, et cetera, et cetera. So that kind of, I think that context is important. On that whole aspect underneath it about the history of medicine and how this is placed within that. I think this book addresses that rather nicely. Yeah, and you know, you have to understand that most doctors, particularly well before 1880, were general practitioners, so they saw everything that came their way. And uh, the idea that a doctor would um, uh, limit his or her practice, and it was almost all men at that time, uh, specifically to children, was almost laughable. In fact, you mentioned Abraham Jacoby, who was often called the father of American pediatrics. He was a German emigre who came here uh, after the revolution of, of 1849. Um, he actually gave a very famous speech to the American Medical Association in 1880, saying that if I simply hung out my shingle as Abraham Jacoby, pediatrician, all of my colleagues would laugh me out of the room. And most of these pediatricians, these early pediatricians who began in the late 19th century, still saw adults uh, about half of their time. Uh, uh, Fielding Garrison was a very famous historian of medicine in the early 20th century called Pediatrics the Dependent Dwarf of Regular Medical Practice. And that's how many people thought of the field at that time. Still do. <laughs> well, and I thought it was interesting that Jacoby is an example of someone who was a bit of an activist. Yeah. And that was looking at medicine in terms of its context and mm -hmm. what other things mm -hmm. that, you know, had this much broader mm -hmm. approach toward it and saw medicine as what politics. Mm -hmm. He was one of these great revolutionaries of, the, you know, of the German revolution of that time and there's a whole group of these people, some who came to America, some who stayed in Europe, who really looked at uh, medicine as just one avenue of how to better the human condition. And Jacoby just this wonderful prototype to to base a mm -hmm. field such as pediatrics, which is, uh, I, mean, I can say this as a, as a pediatrician, but it's the happiest field in all of medicine. And uh, uh, there's a real activist mission to this very day among pediatricians of how the child fits in with society at large and how can you improve society so that you better the lives of your, your patients. Well, one of the early issues was things like malnutrition and working conditions. Um, 
and then uh, and you wrote your article about the uh, the babies, the well babies mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. fair in Indiana. Mm -hmm. Well, exactly, and I think I mean that's one of the things we wanted to bring out in the book is really to understand the complex relationship between society and medicine through the prism of, of pediatrics and unfold the history of pediatrics, which hasn't really received too much attention um, in, in terms of the case studies that we offer in the book. But what you find is, you know, some pediatricians, I mean, kind of more the exception that they would be revolutionary, someone like Jacoby, but more often than not, they were really um, committed reformers um, who would sometimes carry the ideological baggage of their era with them, but nonetheless really wanted to, as Howard mentioned, you know, change and often uplift society by bettering the lives of children and would um, hope to see things like, you know, better uh, uh, indexes when it comes to things like, you know, infant mortality, um, morbidity, et cetera, et cetera, through their, their work. So in the case of the Better Babies contest, the idea there was both, um, was to teach mothers in particular how to um, take better care of their babies and particularly to shield them from childhood ailments that had plagued many families during the 19th century and to learn a whole other host of kind of modern techniques to take care of their children with the hope that better babies would be produced for the area in question and the country at large. So, but I think this theme of pediatricians as reformers, as activists of, uh, of, of different stripes is a theme that's uh, something, you know, was an important thing to bring out in the book. And that's one of the reasons we start with uh, Dr. Spock um, and look at him at the beginning because he's a, an example that more people are familiar with in some of the early 20th century figures. Well, I thought it was interesting that you also discussed, you know, child sexual abuse, which now is regarded, I mean, is very pervasive in the public mm -hmm. discourse uh, about identifying it, dealing with it, and that it, trying to figure out what to do uh, in those mm -hmm. instances. And the pediatrician seems to be kind of swept up into this as, as identifying it and trying to deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there was one article in there about uh, that gonorrhea or those kind of diseases were one of the reasons it got involved with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, yes and no. Um, pediatricians for a long time, as a reflection of society at large, didn't really know how to deal with that problem. You could say we're still in the midst of that, but at least we're talking about it openly and frankly. But the actual diagnosis, child sexual abuse, is rather is, is newer than mm -hmm. pediatrics in itself. It's maybe 30 or 40 years old. And uh, many of the pediatricians of the early eras of the 1880s, 90s, hundreds, tens, people like Abraham Jacoby uh, and others, Henry Koplik, who was a very famous pediatrician of that era in New York, uh, would see cases of gonorrhea in young girls and come up with very different causes that somehow someone with the disease touched that child, but they weren't at least in print making the connection that we would immediately make today. And that makes a great deal of sense about how uncomfortable people are with this mm -hmm. remarkably horrific problem. One of the, my favorite, of that particular article, that was written by Hughes Evans of University of Alabama, who's doing a lot of wonderful work on this topic, is the um, invention of the U-shaped toilet seat, <laughs> which is really, <laughs> I, I just love this, I bring it up as many times as I can, but if ever, ever all of us have gone to a bathroom in a public, public bathroom, the toilet seat is U-shaped, because it was concerning, that s it w the concern was that someone with gonorrhea or syphilis would somehow touch that other part of the toilet seat, and then the next person would sit on that seat and contract the disease. Now, we all know, of course, today that you cannot get gonorrhea from a toilet <laughs> seat, yet the U-shaped toilet <laughs> seats have persisted to this very day. <laughs> so medicine there was also touching into technology. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and the whole notion of how uh, uh, medicine can impact on public health and uh, the ideas of how can you reform society. I mean, one of the things that Alex brought up about uh, more people are living in the city, and you brought up the issues of nutrition. Well, what, what, is, what is causing infant mortality 100 years ago? First of all, today, 9 out of 1,000 babies die before their first birthday. Still too high. But back in the turn of the last century, 
it was 200 babies before their first birthday, and then before the fifth birthday, another 200 babies. That's a lot of children who are dying every year. And the things that they're dying of are almost exclusively infectious diseases, diphtheria, whooping cough, measles, and so on, things that we have vaccines for today. And the other are issues of malnutrition. And you have to remember that the idea of infant formulas, artificial formulas that we feed babies through the bottle, were just being invented at that time. And if you were a cutting edge pediatrician, that's really what you were working on. Every pediatrician in America had his or her own infant formula that they were touting and, and pushing. Well, and I noticed there were growth standards were mm -hmm. part of that. You know, weight and height were measurements that would be used to figure out if that infant was thriving mm -hmm. or was progressing properly. Uh, one thing I, I don't want to let go by is how this book was influenced and shaped by the symposium at the University of Michigan uh, that was named for David Murray Cowie, mm -hmm. the University of Michigan's first professor of pediatrics. Yeah. Cowie's a, a fascinating man. Um, I, I sort of met him indirectly. He was long dead, but I met him indirectly <laughs> as a medical student. He. Uh, was named the first professor of pediatrics at Michigan in 1921 or 1922, depending on which region's report you read. Um, we're rather late at University of Michigan of having a fully established department of pediatrics by about 10 or 15 years. It was attached to the Department of Internal Medicine up before that period of time. Cowie was actually trained as an internist, but had an interest in gastrointestinal diseases and infectious diseases, so it was a natural segue. But his great claim to fame was that he uh, developed iodized salt as a preventive against goiter. And the state of Michigan was in the heart of the goiter belt, so he worked very hard and did an enormous amount for the, for the nation's public health. You don't see goiter very often today because of iodized salt. But we wanted, at the Center for the History of Medicine, we wanted to honor David Murray Cowie. Uh, and we also wanted to create a symposium where we invited all of our contributors for a, a really, well, it was a wild weekend for historians, if you will, mm -hmm. and we all presented these papers, and what was really a lot of fun was the interaction that went on. Uh, we asked questions, we spoke about it, and I think it made for a better book in the end because there was that interaction, that conversation between the scholars. I was pretty impressed with the participants. I mean, you mm -hmm. had a fair range there of yeah. interests and, and so forth. Um, and there's the, the, in your book is the uh, chapters that have the rubric of standardizing the child. We talked a little bit about that, but maybe we can go back about those for growth. And then there was um, uh, also, so maybe we can talk a little bit more mm -hmm. about that as mm -hmm. the, the, the growth issue and how that was monitored. Sometimes it got a little excessive, I think. But well, I think that the whole issue of standardization is really a double-edged sword, and that's one of the things we try to bring out in the volume, in that, you know, if you're, once you get into, you know, thousands if not millions of children and you need to, you know, look for certain disease patterns or, you know, look at certain, you know, standards of maturation, you need to come up with some sorts of norms. Because on the one hand, there's a need to come up with norms that can help identify certain diseases, look for things that would be, you know, in acute cases, patterns of malnutrition, you know, patterns of maturation, etc. But if you look at the history of the development of standards and norms in the the United States across the 20th century, you'll find that it was very complex and something that, one, often produced a lot of anxiety in parents themselves, like, is my child up to snuff? Does my child meet the standards? If my child is outside of the bounds of what's normal, you know, is he or she going to be okay? So there was that psychological aspect of it. And then one of the things that we tried to bring out in the volume two was there's a, there at least in the U.S., you know, really something in the early to mid 20th century, there's a very racial component to the standards in that they were based on, um, f for the most part, if you look at both the younger children and the adolescent growth standards, on um, white, middle class, urban boys. And that, those became the template and what was developed over time on the national level. That event, that now that's up for debate and that's changing and there's, you know, debates are raging on and on about what's the best way to, um, to kind of trace the growth of ethnically and socially diverse children. But so the part in, in terms of that part of the book, standardizing the child, it was really to get at the 
both the technical history of it and the social history of it, but also the psychological aspects of it and how those kinds of norms have taken a toll both on parents and then there's an article in there which starts off with uh, by Heather Monroe Prescott which starts off with a uh, um, quote from something that was a TV series in a book about a boy who is basically traumatized by the fact that he's not tall enough. He just falls barely within the bounds of normal for his height. So, um, but there's, you know, there's a lot more that can be said about that. I don't know if you want to add Well, there's that. even a modern uh, coda to this, um, the growth standards that anyone who's taken their child to a pediatrician, these growth curves, and it, they're basically uh, confidence intervals of 5 to 95th percentile. If you're in the white part, <laughs> as opposed to the pink or blue, depending <laughs> if you're a girl or boy, you're normal. But you'll hear parents saying, as Alex is alluding, my kid's in the 50th percentile, and the next guy, my kid's 75th. You know, there's no right. difference. This kid's a little bit larger. Or they go to a talk. special school or right, something. Right. For it, yeah. What? And some of these growth curves, the most famous ones that were used up until very recently, were based on about 10 or 15,000 children. They were boys and girls who grew up outside of Ohio who were all formula-fed, were all uh, basically white and uh, you know Anglo-American kids. What has happened in the last year or so is that the CDC, the National Institutes of Health, and the National Center for Health Statistics have amassed data from hundreds of thousands of babies all the way to 20 years of age of all various ethnicities, black, white, Asian, what have you, uh, breastfed as well as formula fed, and the growth curves are much more accurate. Now, they're only models, but they're much better because if, for example, you took Asian kids. Asian babies tend to be smaller than white American babies. Uh, and if you took an Asian child whose parents were born, say, in Korea, but they immigrated here, that baby would be probably growing normally if you used a Korean growth chart, but that child might be off the scale for an American growth chart. And that would cause a great deal of undue psychological trauma. With these new growth curves, because they're broader, they're based on more data, that's been bumped out, but of course it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. So it is a double-edged sword. You need something to say, well, gee, I, that kid's not growing perfectly well, but you also have to give guidance to parents mm -hmm. and children alike that, you know, normal, so mm -hmm. there's a wide disparity for what normal is. Well, one of the things that fascinated me and is kind of uh, examined in several different ways in the book is that pediatrics comes off as a specialty, it emerges from general medicine, but then there's some other dynamics that emerge as it does that, and one of them is this, you know, standardization, um, and uh, then there's talking about the new pediatrics, um, so it starts to have its own identity much more than just being, mm -hmm. you know, a subset of mm -hmm. general medicine. Well, you know, one thing about pediatrics, uh, and I think Alex got into this, you know, it's not an organ-based specialty, so that you're really doing, uh, it's really a wonderful specialty for a historian because it's changed over time. You're studying that infant to childhood to, to adolescence to young adulthood, and there are different uh, diseases at those different points of time. There are different needs, there are different psychological states, there are different nutritional issues, and so on. Another thing that has changed over the past century are the type of diseases in the pediatrician's portfolio. As we have conquered, and I put those in quotation marks, various infectious diseases, or we see less of them, uh, we don't, you know, for example, at, at, at Michigan, the pediatrics is literally, the, na the name of the department is the Department of Pediatrics and Communicable Diseases, because so much of what we did in the 1920s had to do with infectious diseases. That's now a subspecialty of pediatrics, but you'll see low morbidity, low mortality diseases. My clinic this afternoon was a kid with drug abuse, another kid with attention deficit disorder, and a third kid who was overweight. Now, none of these, these are all serious problems. I don't mean to diminish them, but none of them would have been the types of problems a pediatrician of only 50 or certainly 70 years ago would have seen. They would have been too busy stamping out measles and <laughs> mumps and things like that. Well, and I think that brings up another point, which is that, um, you know, just as we've seen in, if we look at the market and we look at how products are marketed, 
niches get smaller and smaller and smaller so it's the tweens it's you know the one to two year old group and you know to some extent that reflects you know changes that we've seen in pediatrics itself over the past century and I think it's really important to note that the whole um, subfield of adolescent medicine for example didn't really come into being until the 1960s and again like in the late um, 19th in the late 1800s pediatrics was a product of this whole social matrix that I alluded to before so was adolescent medicine a product really of its time both in terms of medical discoveries and innovations and in terms of the types of you know politics that were going on in the United States in the 1960s and the types of generational conflicts that you're seeing between parents and children so the Society for Adolescent Medicine I think was created in 1968 and adolescence itself while alluded to before by some physicians and scientists really didn't solidify into an actual you know medically kind of stamped um, you know phase of the life cycle until really really recently so adolescence itself is a very recent phenomenon and I expect with pediatrics into the 21st century we'll, we will you know see maybe not changes that dramatic but developments that will be similar. One of the unexpected things I saw in the book and it's logical is the role of technology mm -hmm. you know all the way from Neil Natal on through mm -hmm. um, and the the interesting thing I thought was, was the guy who invented the ventilator was one of the big values was the study that he did about the, the how it was used but still this tech this element of technology mm -hmm. where now uh, very very tiny babies can uh, be sustained and thrive with this mm -hmm. much more complex technology. I, I didn't, you know, yeah. it's one of those mm -hmm. things you think about, but you don't quite realize. And that's changed markedly even over the past decade. I mean, uh, the, the size of the limit of a premature infant when I was an intern or resident um, has even gone down more in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, the amount of children who would be on infants, premature infants, who would be on ventilators before the development of a, of a substance called surfactant, which is a naturally occurring substance that keeps the air sacs or alveoli in your lungs open, but premature babies have not yet made. The difference of how many ventilators you're running in a neonatal intensive care unit today versus 15 years is about gone down by 90 to 95 percent. So this um, dependence uh, and uh, advancement through technology, be it neonatal medicine or transplant medicine, uh, artificial uh, organs such as dialysis machines, and on and on and on uh, are really quite remarkable. Every time I go into a children's hospital, I'm amazed because things have changed. Mm -hmm. Maybe not every time, but certainly on an annual basis if you were to just do slices across time. Uh, and that's only in the last 15 years that uh, we, we have better and bigger toys and it's not just pediatrics, that's medicine, uh, than we ever had in the generation prior. And one of the you know, important things to note about those toys, so to speak, is all of the ethical issues and conundrums that come with them, with things like, you know, developments in fetal surgery and the ability to keep, you know, infants that wouldn't be able to be kept alive, you know, 10, 15 years ago alive. And you get into very complicated issues and triangulations between, you know, physicians and parents and bioethicists and the like. Um, and that's not just pediatrics, but, you know, it's especially pronounced when you're talking about the possible, mm -hmm. you know, life of a, of a young being. There's a kind of a crossover point, but is there an over, you know, of at what point does the pediatrician become involved with the life? But is there an overlapping now with some of this technology that as the obstetrician becomes uh, aware of issues that are going to, you know, translate over into or carry over into the child's life after birth, is that a point um, that you know the pediatrician starts becoming involved, or it, it really depends on the disease that you're talking about. Uh, there are obstetricians who specialize in fetal medicine and are advancing some of these techniques, like fetal surgery. For example, there are fetal cardiac surgeons who will work on birth defects in really? utero. Really? Yeah, oh, and goodness. can actually do quite a bit of good. Um, but the old adage that's has not changed where 
the obstetrician takes care of the pregnant woman and hands the baby off as soon as it comes out of the birth canal and then the pediatrician takes over immediately thereafter still tends to hold ground um, you know when it's in utero it's the obstetrician's domain when it's in the world it becomes a pediatrician's domain but it's also important to note that that is something that is not holy but just it is distinctly American so in some other countries in Europe and France for example you saw that there was a much closer professional connection between obstetrics and pediatrics and it was in the United States because of the way these different professions branched out and developed vis-a-vis -vis one another that you got this separation which has been you know problematic in some regards in terms of especially in the early 20th century issues of communication and where does the line of one stop and the other begin when you had mentioned how pediatrics, because it's not organ-based, mm -hmm. uh, does touch on other mm -hmm. medical areas, may we explore a little bit more of that, because I think that's important also to understand. Mm -hmm. I think one of them was family medicine. Well, yeah, I think that on one hand, by definition, pediatrics will necessarily connect with many different domains of medicine. And also related to that is something that we pointed out in the book and that Howard has already touched on a little bit is the expanding portfolio of, you know, ailments or diseases. We'll put that in brackets because some of them are, you know, very, you know, socially contextualized of, you know, specific diseases that would be under the rubric of a pediatrician. So, you know, you were mentioning before issues of, you know, obesity or, you know, psychological mm -hmm. issues. Um, even issues with, I mean, you, what you see a lot in the 1960s and 70s is some pediatricians being interested in, but others not being interested in dealing with things like, you know, uh, parental, you know, conflicts between parents and teenagers, you know, kind of the basic, you know, psychological or kind of teenage rebellion that you would get in, in, in that particular phase in, the li in life. So yes, I mean, it's, that's part of the, one of the reasons why pediatrics is so fascinating is it crisscrosses into these domains and it's also why in recent years especially it, you couldn't really come up with like one disease or two or three, you know, quintessential diseases that define the field, whereas that would be easier in other more organ-based specialties. Well, there was that concept in the book about holistic, yes. and it seems like that's central to, you know, pediatrics mm -hmm. is that you have to be aware of the totality of mm -hmm. what's going on. Mm -hmm. Well, there's also, you know, you're, while you're not a family physician in terms of taking care of beyond the age of 21, if you're an American pediatrician, that's when we traditionally stop seeing a patient. Um, but you are taking care of the parents too, uh, in a different way. Uh, what I've always been struck, as a, if I'm ever a patient or a family member or a patient, is that doctors who take care of adults will focus specifically on the person in the bed. That is, that's how they're trained. That is their responsibility. While a pediatrician would never think of that for a moment because they know there's a mother and a father that they have to explain things to or things aren't going to get done. Mm -hmm.